This is BTV World. I am Sayyid Shabahat Ali and you are watching Fault Lines. 11 days of war against unarmed Palestinians is over. Or we may say it has taken a halt. The life losses, the destruction of public assets, the casualties can only be counted through the estimates provided by the oppressor and that is the state of Israel. As no independent news agency or humanitarian organization has an access to the affected area. Antonio Gatris, Secretary General of United Nations recently said that if there is a hell on earth, it is the lives of children in Gaza. And he is not alone in his concerns. The fact remains that Palestinians will not accept a peace process that leaves Palestinians out or attempts to give Jerusalem to the occupier Israel. Israel with its settlement activities is seeking to displace forcibly Palestinian families from East Jerusalem to raise any Palestinian presence in the city. So how United Nations is helping the people of Palestine in this hour of crisis? How neighboring countries have responded to the destruction of Palestinian people during these 11 days of crisis? How will the reconstruction in Gaza will take place? We all have all of this in today's program. Watch our package before I bring my first guest to the program. With a forced ouster of the Palestinian families from Sheikh Jarrah and the active protection given by the Israeli Defense Forces to those stealing houses, major acts of violence were witnessed. The Israeli Defense Forces attacked not just Al-Aqsa in the holy month of Ramzan, but also attacked peaceful protesters in the Gaza Strip, prompting Hamas to launch a series of attacks and a quick response by the IDF. The high civilian casualties, which now stands at 250 plus, including 94 children, displacements of families, attack on journalists, and many other such instances, sparked international protests. The immense international pressure on Israel ultimately resulted in the Egypt-brokered ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. Israel has temporarily opened a crossing into Gaza, allowing food, fuel and medicine into the territory, which had earlier been blocked. While Gazan streets erupted with joy and celebrations after the announcement of a ceasefire, Israel was caught beating many civilians only a few hours after the ceasefire announcement. The Hamas leader, Yahya Sinwar, threatened to renew fighting if Israel violated Al-Aqsa again. U.S. President Joe Biden healed Egypt's role in brokering peace between Israel and Hamas, thereby bringing peace in the Middle East. This also brings to light if there was any effort by other country in the Middle East regarding peace process between Israel and Palestine, or if there will be in the future. The international community this time around has recognized the violent aggression exhibited by Israel, with many acknowledging a tectonic shift within the United States. Many Democrats are now pushing back the defense aids being given to Israel by the United States as well. The United Nations Human Rights Council is preparing to investigate Israeli bombardment of Gaza with the chief, Michelle Bachelet, stating that it may constitute to war crimes, with the after-effects of Black Lives Matter lighting a global movement, awareness and condemnation against human rights atrocities across the world. The Israeli atrocities against Palestinians have also been highlighted on social media. Will Israel stop the atrocities and humanitarian violations of the future? And how can the peace ensue? My first guest in the program is Professor Abdul Hamid Sayyam from New York. Professor Sayyam is a leading journalist covering United Nations for over 20 years. He is himself an ex-UN staff. Welcome to the program, Professor. United Nation has been created or was created with an idea of controlling the conflict or stopping the conflict from not to happen. We don't talk about Palestine for now. Tell me if there are any other conflicts that UN has been able to stop or has been able to overcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shabhat Ali, for inviting me to talk on fault line. Yes, it does. It can. It has addressed many conflicts and was able to solve them. If there is unanimity in the Security Council, for example, the UN was able to uh, solve the conflict in East Timor, in Cambodia, in Namibia, South Africa, El Salvador, Nicaragua, 
uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and many other places. For example, uh, look at the conflict in, uh, in Iraq, for example, when they occupied Kuwait. The UN Security Council was united and it was able to address that uh, uh, conflict and solve it. When there is no unanimity, then conflicts uh, will linger and stay for a long time. For example, the question of Palestine, the question of Kashmir, the question of Cyprus, the question of uh, Somalia. And now, as we see the case in Syria, there is no unanimity in the Security Council. But the Security Council, if it's not united, conflicts seem to linger and last longer. And without having Security Council unanimity, then there is very little hope to address these conflicts. Mr. Sayyam, tell me then why about the issue of Palestine United Nation has not been able to play an effective or an efficient role. How satisfied you are with the efforts being made for the issue of Palestine by the United Nations? I don't think there is what we can call that criminality. I mean, the UN was unable to address the question of Palestine because the UN was not empowered by the permanent members of the Security Council to address the question of Palestine. It has passed many resolutions, in fact, and they, these resolutions could uh, address the question of Palestine, but it was prevented from implementation. I give you example. The UN in 1947 passed the resolution 181, which divide Palestine into two states, one Jewish state and one Arab state. The Jewish state was established, but the Arab state had never been established because of the major powers who did not empower the UN to create that state. For example, the UN passed resolution 242 in 1967 following the war. It asked Israel to withdraw from the land it occupied after that war. However, Israel had never withdrew from that uh, land that it occupied in that war. That is the problem. So I don't say that the UN, uh, it was at fault as a UN, as a mechanism. The fault falls on the permanent member of the Security Council. There is one permanent member, which is the United States, have been protecting Israel inside the UN and outside the UN. It empowered Israel militarily, economically, financially, uh, uh, in terms of intelligence, in terms of uh, every aspect of empowerment, including protecting Israel in the United Nations. Mr. Sayam, you are a Palestinian by your origin. You are covering United Nations for over 20 years. You are, you are an access staff of United Nations. So I'm sure you have a keen interest in the resolutions that have been passed so far by the United Nations in the issue of Palestine. Can you name me a few significant developments that have been made in the past or even recently which can be applauded, uh, United Nations, which, which United Nations can be applauded for? There are many resolutions passed uh, regarding the question of Palestine, many of them very important. There are resolutions that has to deal with Jerusalem, for example, Resolution 476 and 478 in 1980. This is, these are two important resolutions that declare everything that Israel does in Jerusalem is nil and void and called on countries not to recognize the occupation of East Jerusalem. There are other resolutions that deal with the uh, illegality of the settlement. There is the ICJ opinion, legal opinion, on the 4th of July 2004, saying that the separation wall is illegal and should be dismantled. There is a resolution, many resolutions by the UN General Assembly, for example, uh, Resolution 3236 of 1974, which spills all the Palestinian rights, including their, uh, their right to self-determination, their right to an independent state, their right to be represented by their own representation like the PLO. All these uh, uh, items in that resolution empower the Palestinian people even to fight for their rights. It says the Palestinians have the right to resist occupation with, me with the means available to them as long as they are in conformity with the UN Charter. So there are many resolutions the UN passed regarding the settlement, regarding Jerusalem, regarding the uh, natural resources, regarding the, uh, the right of the Palestinian 
to live in their own land, the, uh, right, not, uh, the right of Palestinian to keep their leadership, not to be expelled. So many aspects of the conflict had been addressed by the UN. However, the implementation is another story altogether. Sayan, tell us, uh, we have heard that uh, there were efforts being made, uh, even during these 11 days for ceasefire, and many uh, nations were trying to stop a trial. But we came to know that these efforts were sabotaged because they were, these were not on the terms that Israel wanted. Uh, tell us a bit more about it and also tell us what happened later on, why Egypt then eventually became and how Egypt eventually became successful in bringing the ceasefire resolution. I don't want to call it ceasefire. Ceasefire are between two armies, two equal armies fighting or two equal states fighting and there is ceasefire. This is an aggression against the Palestinian people. There was an outcry and Israel found itself in a state of uh, limbo. They cannot impose their will. They cannot break the will of the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people continued to resist. They didn't raise the white flag and Israel found itself in a state of no winning and no losing. That, uh, uh, in fact, morally they were losing. They have the power, they have the air force, they have the uh, uh, land and sea uh, armies. They could take the war to another level, of course, but they, they were losing. They were losing at the international level. They were losing at the UN um, public opinion, at the world public opinion. They found themselves in a state of, uh, of siege by the world public opinion. So they decided to stop. The Palestinian did not initiate this war and they could continue forever. They are fighting for their survival. They are fighting for their rights. They are fighting for their homes and for their families. So they have nothing to lose, in fact. As long as Palestinians are under occupation, they will continue to fight. So, in fact, uh, the, the U.S. came to the region to uh, rescue Israel from that, uh, uh, from that uh, problem they found themselves at. They cannot win and they don't want to lose, and that's why it was declared a kind of end of hostilities. Also interviewed Shah Mahmood Qureshi on his recent visit to United Nations. I think you interviewed him for Al, Al Arabiya, and you were also covering Pakistan's resolutions presented in United Nations. Uh, tell me, as you have this vast experience of covering United Nations resolutions, how effective or cosmetic Pakistan's arrangement is for you from your point of view? Regarding the uh, visit of the Pakistani Foreign Minister Makhdoum Shah Mahmoud uh, Qureshi to the UN and his efforts, in fact, he did a great job. I was happy to meet with him and talk to him about the efforts that uh, Pakistan is leading in the name of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. He uh, gave an excellent speech in the General Assembly, and he was behind that meeting together with Turkey and uh, a few other countries, like, for example, Indonesia, Malaysia, um, and Niger. So uh, he gave a, a strong speech. There was mobilization of public opinion in the General Assembly, and I think it went very well, that meeting in the uh, General Assembly last Thursday. But also he took the issue of Palestine to the Human Rights Council. And he, together with Palestine, put on the table a draft resolution to investigate the Israeli crimes in the West Bank and Gaza. And luckily, on uh, Wednesday, the Human Rights Council adopted that resolution with the 24 uh, votes in favor, 9 against, and 13 uh, abstention. This is an important resolution because the Human Rights Council will establish an uh, independent investigative team, investigation team, which will not only investigate the crimes that committed in Gaza in the last uh, 11 days of uh, hostilities, but will continue to monitor the crimes committed against the Palestinian people, not only in Gaza, but in all of Palestine, including 1948. So I think uh, Qureshi and his efforts, together with his colleagues from OIC, 
there are some Arab states, Palestine and Turkey in particular, were able to get to these kind of achievements. Thank you very much, uh, Abdul Hadimid Sayyam, for taking out time and participating in program from New York. Ladies and gentlemen, now I have two uh, other guests in my program. My first guest in this segment is Yusuf Al Halu, a famous journalist uh, covering Middle East. He is based in the United Kingdom, participating in my program for the first time. I welcome you, Yusuf, to my program. And with him, I have Cass Zadan, who is a human rights activist, former member of parliament from Jordan. Um, I welcome both of you to my program. Uh, Yusuf, I'll be starting from you. How happy or satisfied you are with the current arrangement, which United Nations calls ceasefire. My first guest disagreed with the terminology. And how do you see things going forward from this point onwards? Well, it's, um, it's important uh, to see there is uh, international mobilization to bring an end to the um, Israeli aggression uh, against the Palestinians, whether they are in Gaza, the West Bank, or East Jerusalem. Um, we need to address the root causes uh, of this violence, which is the occupation that started in 1948. So the role of the United Nations and the Security Council and other international bodies is important because it's uh, emboldened the, the steadfastness of the Palestinians. They have grievances. They have been grieving for the past seven decades. Um, but unfortunately, uh, Palestinians, they lost hope in the so-called international community. They accuse the international community of being silent. They, they call it hypocrisy. Uh, conspiracy of silence. Um, but as I have to say that the world is changing, to be honest, uh, Israel no longer um, has monopoly on the narrative. Um, can you imagine for the first time, maybe in, in decades, that the New York Times published the photos and names of uh, 67 Palestinian children who were murdered by Israel's aggression on Gaza. Um, the mediation efforts led by the United Nations and some Arab countries, uh, it was important to uh, stop an end to the bloodshed um, but at the hands of uh, the Israeli military occupation forces, which has uh, the fourth powerful army in the region, um, who was attacking defenseless population uh, who were using Gaza as an experimental field. Um, uh, the United States uh, provides uh, diplomatic and military support uh, to Israel, and Israel um, has been enjoying uh, a green light, uh, has been enjoying a culture of impunity. Um, but as I said, you know, the mobilization that we saw in the capitals worldwide across the whole world, uh, it was awakening. Uh, there is a shift in the narrative. There is a shift in the West. There is a shift in the media. Um, the U.S. Security, Coun uh, Security Council um, is not able to um, impose uh, its resolutions on Israel. Israel has violated many numerous uh, U.N. resolutions, uh, and we know why. It's because of the American veto. Um, we need to see more. Um, condemnations are not enough anymore. Palestinians, they have lost faith uh, in, in those uh, superpowers uh, because it's obvious that the root of this, all the, all the root of the problem is the occupation. Palestinians have been fighting for self-determination. They have been fighting for liberation. They have been fighting for freedom. So this is, it's very simple. It's not about uh, rockets being fired from Gaza. Um, the resistance is a legitimate technique um, enshrined by um, the UN. Um, so knee, a lot of things need to be done. Palestinians ask for compensation for the suffering for the past seven decades. Um, they want the free loving people of the world, the conscious people of the world to continue support the Palestinians because now Gaza is no longer uh, you know, Yusuf, um, allow me to take gas Zadan from Jordan into the program and then let, let us connect back to what you are saying. It's a very significant point. Gas the role of Jordan is under spotlight. Jordan is a major neighboring state, but we see a lot of effort coming from the side of Egypt. Jordan, if it has played any role at all, was not at least in the spotlight. So you being based in Jordan, can you tell us about the role of Jordan in this recent crisis? Thank you, Shabbat, for having me again on fault lines. We do not know Jordan to make any major development, including the request of ceasefire or any particular democratic efforts in the United Nations? Well, um, the answer is as follows. Um, Jordan has had a, an enormous role uh, uh, 
in the whole history of the Palestinian uh, uh, Israeli crisis, um, Jordan, Jordan and, 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 and Palestine, uh, this inseparable relationship uh, uh, on, on, all, on all records. And, uh, and therefore, Jordan, historically, and uh, because of as well the Hashemite uh, custodianship over the holy sites in Jerusalem, the Christian and Muslim holy sites, has always had a very uh, uh, big uh, uh, role in, in, in solving or trying to reach to an agreement in this issue. Um, Jordan has had a very strong uh, uh, stance uh, lately when it uh, completely refused the deal of the century, the so-called deal of the century, which was uh, or was tried to be imposed by Trump and his allies in the in the Middle East. And this, of course, uh, uh, did not materialize. One of the main reasons was the Jordanian diplomatic efforts uh, that stopped such uh, uh, a plan that 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 was there as a um, in the middle. It, it 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 didn't work, and and that was because of the uh, Jordanian uh, di- diplomacy. And therefore, Jordan has always been. Uh, supportive of the Palestinian issues. Um, if we would like to talk about the government, the government was always talking about a two-state solution. This was the only solution because other than that, uh, uh, the, the, the the occupation, the Israeli occupation is going to run into the, a so-called apartheid state, which couldn't be acceptable uh, at this time. And this time uh, uh, we are living basically uh, an apartheid state. Yusuf, coming back to you, how satisfied you are with the role of uh, the neighborhood of Palestine, particularly the Arab states that were very vocal in the past? How happy or unhappy are you with their role in the current crisis? Well, it's important to boost the morale and steadfastness of Palestinians by neighboring Arab countries, um, especially um, Egypt and Jordan, who uh, signed peace treaties uh, with Israel. Um, seeing the, the masses, uh, you know, marching towards the border uh, between uh, Jordan and, and uh, occupied Palestine, Israel, it was um, uplifting. It was um, important to see that um, Arab people uh, in Arab countries are still holding um, to the cause, of the, to, the, to the just cause. Um, on the popular level, um, it was um, great to see these people voicing their uh, support, voicing their anger. Uh, on the governmental level, um, Palestinians were expecting more. They were expecting uh, the withdrawal of ambassadors from uh, Cairo and Amman. Um, we know that um, you know a lot of things can be done, but um, treaties um, you know make things um, difficult for uh, the diplomatic uh, efforts to uh, go on. Um, on the personal level, um, I think Palestinians are uh, resisting uh, an occupation, colonization. Uh, they are defending their dignity. They are defending Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, which is Islam's third holiest site. And to be honest, you know, everybody knows that Al-Aqsa Mosque and Jerusalem Al-Quds is, does not only belong to Palestinian Muslims or Christians. It belongs to all Muslims worldwide. Um, as I said, um, a lot of things can be done. Palestinians were expecting more. Uh, the bloodshed has been uh, shed for so long. And it's important that uh, we need to keep the momentum going. Um, Cass, do you agree that the role of the neighboring states, um, including Jordan, have diluted after three conflicts uh, or after three wars with Israel, uh, particularly uh, the defeat in uh, 1967 and 73? Do you think these were decisive movements to decide that the Arabian states around Palestine are not uh, going to be on top of their thoughts now? Well, in reply to this question, I would like to 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 talk about the Jordanian uh, position. The Jordanian position uh, remained as is. The support remained as is. Uh, again, uh, the the historical relationship between the Palestinian people and the Jordanian people uh, is is of utmost importance. Uh, the occupation has always tried to uh, uh, put more and more pressure. Uh, uh, on the Palestinian people within its territories, 
doing this apartheid state issues that they are doing, etc. And Jordan has always uh, 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 had a good stance with respect to the to the other Arab nations. Well, I think that's a question that has to be uh, asked to the uh, other Arab nations. However, um, some are still uh, 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 very supportive of the Palestinian. Issue. Yusuf, uh, you just heard what he said. What is your take on, on this question? Of course, we highly appreciate the stance, the honorable stance of uh, the Kingdom of Jordan. Um, they have been playing an important role to protect the holy site. Uh, we know that Al-Waqf, um, they have a presence there. And uh, um, I, I personally respect uh, the role of Jordan. Uh, I visited Jordan a couple of times. Uh, it's 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 a place where um, a, a, a big number of Palestinians are residing who were forced to flee back in 1948. Uh, regarding the uh, other role of Arabs, other countries, of course, um, unfortunately, uh, there is a, a campaign of normalization that uh, took place uh, recently across uh, uh, the Arab world, mainly in the Gulf states, and um, we saw uh, that. Uh, Palestinian cause was sold. Uh, this is what Palestinians say. Um, um, and, and these efforts really, um, it angered uh, the Palestinians that how come that the Palestinians uh, who uh, are being described now as the victimizers, whereas Israel is the victimizer that colonized historic Palestine. Um, and uh, there is manipulation, there is misinformation, um, twisting the facts that it's the Palestinians who are the aggressors, uh, Palestinians who are the oppressors, whereas Israel is, is laughing and enjoying this shift in the Arab world. Um, uh, I mean, I would like to see more, to be honest. Um, Israel is the root of the problem. Uh, the military occupation has to end. Uh, the dehumanization of Palestinians has to end. Um, Palestinians have been um, treated as subhumans. But I can tell you that uh, the, Yusuf, the recent but, but how do in you see has Yusuf, brought Palestine back to the forefront. Yusuf, how do you see the role of Egypt, which I think you missed because they clearly played a big role in this uh, diplomatic effort being made in the end? Yes, um, Egypt has been always playing a major role in uh, striking uh, truce or a ceasefire uh, as a mediator. Um, Israel, Egypt wants to maintain that uh, role because it shares the border with, with Palestine, uh, the Rafah border crossing. Um, uh, Egypt has been um, an important element uh, in this uh, conflict. So uh, President Sisi, um, who was assisted or instructed or um, gave, was given um, space to maneuver by the US administration, was able to um, uh, reach this uh, ceasefire. Um, the Palestinians highly appreciate uh, the role of any Arab government uh, that uh, stands by them, by, sub by, by supports the Palestinian cause. Um, but as I said, it's not enough. More has to be done. Uh, yes. Israel is the, the occupier, and uh, Palestinians have been suffering under decades of military occupation. Uh, Palestinians have to be supported all the way, financially, diplomatically. Got your uh, point, like, Yusuf. Got your point. This is very important that a lot more has to be done. Uh, my closing question uh, from you, Cass. Uh, in all of this, what has happened, perhaps we have got the Jordan Valley issue somewhere off the lens, which is, a, which is a very important problem for the people living, particularly in West Bank. There is supposed to be their food basket, uh, and there is a lot of strategic significance of this area. Uh, tell us more about it. This is the uh, the way the occupation uh, has been always doing it. They are trying to show the world that they are uh, pursuing peace. However, on ground, they are expanding their um, uh, settlements over and over again. They're not respecting the international law. And Jordan sought that this move of actually uh, acquiring uh, uh, the the uh, Jordan Valley is is uh, is 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 refused completely and Jordan's diplomacy worked very hard towards that issue and that issue is, is, is up to this uh, stance failed. However, this just poses the idea that this occupation does not want peace, they do not believe in peace and uh, this is something that they've always been doing and therefore um, it is there is a problem in dealing with this occupation that don't believe in peace and yet believe in expanding their settlements and uh, 
unfortunately uh, 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 being more and more hostile in the region, which affects the whole region negatively. Uh, one more thing that comes to my mind before we close this uh, session is uh, the issue of the political solution. We have only two problems here uh, on the table, Cass. Uh, one is Hamas that has been the aggressor or has been the side with the weapons in their hand. And the other one is PLO that is the political jargon or the political uh, you know, narrative building without any weapons in hand. Which side do you support in person or do you think is doing more? to the uh, greater good of the Palestinian. Well, I'm going to, this, sometimes there's a difference between the formal uh, Jordanian uh, uh, position, which is the two-state solution, and the Jordanian people. The Jordanian people, they, they believe that Palestine uh, is for Palestinians, that this is an occupation that uh, uh, took uh, a land unlawfully, uh, kicked out its people, uh, uh, killed them, uh, continues to kill them at, at, uh, at every chance. And therefore, the Jordanian people believe that Palestine, the whole of Palestine, uh, uh, is uh, uh, is Palestinian and therefore the occupation must cease and and uh, and must leave and and Palestine has to go back to the sovereignty of the Palestinians and this is the Jordanian people's uh, uh, view and therefore Jordanians especially in the last attack against uh, uh, Jerusalem and Gaza they were uh, fully behind uh, the resistance whether that resistance was uh, uh, Hamas, whether that resistance was from within the uh, 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 67 and 48 areas within Israel, or whether it was in Jerusalem, which sparked it all. And therefore, the Jordanians do not differ between uh, sects within the, the, the Palestinian Authority. However, they support the Palestinian people, they support the resistance, and they support uh, uh, their, their notion for freedom. Thank you very much, Cass. Thank you very much, Yusuf, for being with me in my program. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a break and we'll join back with the last segment of the program. Stay with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I am joined by retired Ambassador Rafat Masood, who has represented Pakistan on many diplomatic assignments. She has been our guest before and she has very kindly agreed to be our guest again. Madam, welcome to the program. Thank you. Pleasure and we are talking about the issue of Palestine and Israel. But before we jump to Palestine, I would like you to talk about this diplomatic efforts made by Shah Mahmood Qureshi and, and the eventual outcome that we saw from the United Nations. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, bah -bah Thank you very much uh, for having me on the show again. Um, you see, Pakistan has a very unique role. Uh, we have always historically played a very important part in uh, bringing about some kind of dialogue or pursuing a dialogue between the Israelis and uh, the Palestinians. We have played an important role in the Muslim Ummah. So we have a, a reputation. Pakistan has a reputation uh, because of our diplomatic efforts, both in the United Nations, New York, in Geneva, also in the OIC, of being a country which uh, not only has a large Muslim population, but is actively involved in all issues concerning the Muslim Ummah, and mostly so the Palestinian question and, of course, Kashmir. So uh, this effort by uh, our government this time uh, is part of that historical and ongoing efforts that we continue to play and the role that we continue to play. Um, as you well know, uh, it's now all in the news and its history that uh, we started with the, the Islamic uh, Ummah, with the OIC, um, and then we moved on uh, to the UN we were able, uh, Foreign Minister Qureshi was able to um, mobilize uh, many countries in the Islamic world, uh, including Indonesia, for instance, uh, and Turkey, which played a very prominent role. Iran has always played a very uh, positive role towards Palestine and has always, uh, Pakistan and Iran have worked together in the uh, OIC and in the UN. And after the OIC, we uh, moved to the UN and the UN Security Council uh, was, uh, meeting was held, which didn't produce anything, so we moved on to the General Assembly. 
So Pakistan, uh, as I said, uh, uh, is in a unique position to continue to put pressure, um, diplomatic, political, moral pressure on the world community, uh, both bilaterally and multilaterally. Madam, this, this uh, resolution is specifically tabled by Pakistan and UNG. Tell us about it. What is its significance for, for this issue and what see, comes to Pakistan with that? Um, frankly speaking, uh, there are a host of resolutions in the United Nations on the Palestinian question and on other issues around the world. It is uh, unfortunate that uh, many of these resolutions, the majority in fact, don't see the light of day. Um, I think for Palestine, you could say there are umpteen number of resolutions which have been pa pa passed in, uh, in the, in historically also in the past. Uh, just like in Kashmir or in other uh, countries or regions where conflicts are taking place. Um, and then, you know, the Security Council resolutions also exist. Pakistan continues to play an important role in pushing these resolutions and making sure that they are passed by this uh, General Assembly or by the Security Council. What impact it has, we all know. It's, it is unfortunate that while the resolutions are passed, and they're very important because they focus on uh, bringing about a cessation of hostilities. They, they focus on peace and security, all these resolutions. They focus on humanitarian assistance. They focus on resolving conflicts and resolving issues. But to be frank, I think uh, we all know uh, that many of these resolutions don't see the light of day. Uh, and we also know the reasons for that, the, the political environment that exists both uh, in the United Nations and globally as well. So, but that does not mean, uh, I would like to emphasize here, that we should stop or we should just sit back and say, well, since UN resolutions, so many are passed and nothing really comes out of it, so what's the point? I think it's very, very important to continue to apply the pressure. And when, you, when a global body like the United Nations meets, it's resolu and when so many countries uh, speak with one voice against atrocities committed in a particular region, in this case, Palestine, the occupied territories, that does have an impact. If it doesn't have an impact on um, bringing about a resolution, it has an impact on public opinion. But Madam, it's often said that the role of Islamic countries in general or in collectivity has not been very effective. And it is also said that uh, over a period of time, the onus of this Philistine cause has drifted from the Arab states and now, you know, the flag carriers are states like Pakistan or Turkey, the non-Arab Muslim nations. What do you think of it? You know, uh, Pakistan uh, has always been uh, a vocal, a very loud and vocal supporter of the Palestinian question always, uh, ever since our independence. Uh, true, maybe other um, Islamic countries, non-Arab countries, perhaps were not so much in the forefront. But, uh, and it was first of all the Arab countries that would uh, speak out. And then gradually we have seen how the political developments that have taken place within the Arab world, uh, the pressures, the global pressures, the the challenges that they meet, the Arab countries, uh, which historically has led to many Arab countries now even recognizing Israel, uh, that has of course impacted on the question of Palestine. It has impacted on the uh, extent to which the, uh, and how forcefully these uh, resolutions could be implemented and how forcefully a, a conflict resolution could be met. And of course, you're right, because now we have, uh, I should say thankfully, to be very honest, we have a, a, a leadership or we have uh, countries in the world who are more focused on these issues, such as Pakistan, as always, but Turkey, Indonesia, Iran, Malaysia. I mean, all these countries, which, as you said, historically were not so much in, in the forefront uh, with the exception of Pakistan, which has always been in the forefront. I think it is a, it is a very opportune moment 
for us as Muslim Ummah that, okay, if the Arab countries have their own challenges, whatever they may be, and that is, of course, a different conversation, but whatever their challenges, we should not, the Muslim countries especially, uh, should not hold back. Because the question of Palestine and the atrocities being committed there are one not only of humanitarian, on humanitarian and human rights issues, but it's a political issue which Pakistan has always supported. It is part of our, it's one of our principles. And uh, we should not uh, draw back from it and we should be happy that other Muslim countries are also now uh, joining Madam, us. A very important question that is often raised is that the demographics of the state of Israel mm. and the area of Palestine, uh, the remaining area of Palestine, the West Bank mm. and, and the Eastern part, or oh, I'm sorry, the West Bank and uh, the Gaza, Gaza Strip. Gaza, yes. Uh, this collectively is in a proportion of 50-50. That means there are 6.2 million Muslims and almost mm. same as the population of Israel that also has a Muslim population, which yes. means that Muslims are still yes. there in a demographic landslide majority. Certainly they cannot be undone. Mm. There are no other lands mm. uh, to receive this amount of people. So what do you believe Israeli government is trying to do with this this issue. I mean, if they carry on with, with this use of violence, this will just create more unrest for them in their own territory, isn't it? They're not moving toward any peaceful solution of it. Um, the question is that does Israel actually want a peaceful solution to this issue? Is Israel's policy to continue the, what I would call, uh, the, um, I would like, I would use the word genocide. Would Israel, is that its policy? Maybe the events of the past few couple of months have, have shown that it is. Israel is not interested in uh, a peaceful solution to this. I Israel only wants that its state should be recognized world over, that it should suppress the Palestinian voice and the Palestinian people and, and also the Muslim voice, because this is a historical conflict, as you know. So um, demographics aside, Muslims in occupied territories, as well as Arabs living in Jerusalem aside, Israeli policy will remain to crush them and, and continue its impunity. And it will find, I mean, this time there was one excuse or other about uh, why they started the conflict this time. But they would always find an excuse to start and to keep the pot simmering. Because Israel does not want, and Israel and its strong allies do not want that there should be stability, peace in this region. This is what I feel. And they will always find some reason or the other whether it is uh, terrorism on the basis of terrorism, whether it is on the basis of, of uh, Hamas activities or, or whatever, or um, uh, the question of Palestine that, you know, this is uh, our, our land and it should be given to the Jews. And you will you, they will always, always continue. Now, the only way to stop that is if the global community and particularly the Muslim communities would unite. Unfortunately, I don't see that happening at the moment. I mean, I don't, I don't think that we are in that position where the Muslim countries or even the global community could unite and put pressure, enough pressure on Israel and its important allies to actually work towards uh, a concrete solution to the problem. I think they keep talking about processes of peace, but that it remains a process. Every time the process gets interrupted, and then the process gets restarted. But there is no uh, movement to actually bring about an end. Thank you very much, Madam, uh, for, uh, for enlightening us on this. Ladies and gentlemen, as Ambassador Rifford said, the pot is, is still simmering. The conflict is still there. The use of violence can start any time. High times for all Muslim nations and states to come forward and to have a more effective dialogue on the floor of United Nations. We'll join you next week with another program. And until then, Allah Hafiz.